Chapter Twenty Six of the Apostle of Alaska: The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. From Judge Duncan's Docket. As to the Indian lawbreakers, Judge Duncan did not always follow the strict letter of the law of the land. For some of their offenses, he made up his mind as to what punishment would be most likely to produce the best results, and then inflicted it, regardless of whether he found it on the leaves of the statute book or not. Fortunately, there were no hair-splitting lawyers to take appeals from his judgment in those cases. He says himself, I sometimes went a little outside the law. I never have allowed myself to stumble over a law when something good was to be accomplished thus the sentence in all cases when an indian had been guilty of an act of violence which might have resulted in death was invariably a public whipping the whole village was then summoned to witness the affair the man was bared to the waist tied to a post and whipped with a rope but not with a cat of nine tails sometimes the whipping was administered by the judge himself but most generally by one of the constables in one case of improper relations with another's wife the injured husband wished to kill the man but mr duncan persuaded him that it would be a greater satisfaction to be allowed to whip the seducer in public i think it may safely be surmised that he did not simply pretend to flog his man once the man to be whipped was of a very savage disposition so much so that the constable said that they dared not whip him for fear that he would kill the one who did it in revenge as soon as he got free now what was to be done the constables were ordered to blindfold him so he could not see who flogged him and were cautioned not to utter a word so that he could not recognize the executioner by his voice when duncan arrived at the whipping post he merely in silence pointed to the constable whom he ordered to do the whipping he trembled and commenced to talk giving expression to his fears i forbade you to talk did i not said mr duncan now that you shall not be in the darkness as to who whipped you know that it was myself he took the rope and laid it on pretty heavily after the whipping the man was incarcerated for two weeks that was the legal part of the punishment mr duncan had him brought to his room every evening and gave him a good lecture he finally succeeded in making the man see that he had really done him a good turn because by whipping him he had probably saved his life as the man he had attacked was still a heathen and would have been likely to take his own revenge while now he had declared himself satisfied with the punishment meted out to his adversary the man who was whipped on this occasion at a meeting not many years ago when those present gave their experiences stood up and said he was now leading a good life i suppose you would like to know what saved me from an evil life he said know then that it was mr duncan's whipping me many years ago such influence had the combination of the gospel message and this policy of mr duncan upon getting the best of the savage disposition of these indians that while there were eleven murders committed among the tribes at fort simpson the first year he was there now for forty years there has not been a case of bloodshed or even an attack with a weapon among the indians who have come with him once when mr duncan was away some of them quarrelled and two of them used their fists upon each other this is the nearest approach to an act of violence committed among them in forty years what white community can show a record like this mr duncan's very decided views upon the efficacy of flogging as a punishment in certain cases may well be worth some attention on the part of criminologists he does not hesitate to say that if a murderer and highway robber was in addition to imprisonment for life or a long term sentenced to be flogged thoroughly every first monday of every month we would have a considerable decrease in the number of these crimes it would certainly be a dread thing for such a criminal to have to look forward to just as the wounds from the last flogging had about nicely healed up probably no man would have to be sentenced the second time for such an offence after he had such an experience for a number of years it might be well worth trying anyhow unless the constitutional prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment would stand in the way but mr duncan did not believe in meeting out flogging as a punishment for wife-beating as the legislatures of delaware and oregon have decreed 
he says it would not be well to send a man back to his wife with a sore and aching back which he could thank her for he would not be likely to say my dear or to speak any very lovely or honeyed words to her when every movement reminded him of what she had brought upon him mr duncan's way of handling these cases was original and effective when a man had been convicted of wife-beating he sentenced him to imprisonment in the village jail but for no definite term he told the man i will not fix the time of your imprisonment i leave that to your wife when she comes to me and tells me that she thinks you have been punished enough you will get out not one day before mr duncan had another peculiar arrangement in connection with his jail he did not feed his prisoners they had to find their own fare while in the calaboose when a wife-beater was incarcerated the constable in charge had orders to lock up with the prisoner the one of his children who brought him his food for an hour or so each day the natural consequence of this was that the prisoner would send continuously word to the wife with the child asking her to pity him gradually of course her heart would soften it hardly ever took more than a week before she would come to mr duncan and say i think my husband has been punished enough now sir he promises that he will be good and never beat me again the prisoner would then be sent for when he arrived mr duncan would go out leaving them alone together in the office for half an hour or so on returning he would take pains to let his coming be known by a loud cough or by shuffling his feet when he opened the door he invariably found them in opposite corners of the room as far away from each other as they could possibly get he then told the man that any one who would beat his wife was a fool what do you think he would say of any one who would take a sharp knife and hack his own hand would you not say he was a fool yes sir well that is just what you have done your wife is part of yourself and you he would say turning to the wife undoubtedly are quite a bit to blame yourself no man will beat a good woman now see if you cannot be better also go home now both of you and behave yourselves if your temper gets the best of you kneel down and ask god to help you to overcome it in only one single case of wife beating had the punishment to be repeated and after two years at metlakatla wife beating became an unknown offence if it existed at all which is doubtful no complaint was ever made of it at any time after that period the stories about the trials of the whiskey sellers before judge duncan would fill a volume i can only give a few one whiskey seller whose name shall not be given was brought into mr duncan's courtroom a large lofty apartment in front of the mission house where four elaborately carved totem poles held up the ceiling he was duly convicted whereupon mr duncan in sentencing him addressed him as follows i have the right to give you six months in jail but as you claim that it is your first offence and as i have never heard of you before i will let you off with one month but as the jail is cold and i am not going to keep a fire going there for your sake i will not order you to be confined in prison you shall go with the constable and live at his home for a month or as long as you do what he tells you if you disobey him i will give him orders to put you in the cell at once he went away mr duncan saw him occasionally but paid no attention to him nor spoke to him until his time was up he then sent for him to tell him that he was now a free man and could go wherever he wanted to mr duncan was surprised or pretended to be when the man thanked him for his kindness and said i had never lived in a christian family before i have never seen the life of christian people until now your constable insisted that i should be present at their family prayers every day the kindness of the whole family has made such an impression on me that i have made up my mind to become a good man i have never owned a bible before i am going to get one before i leave metlakatla and he did buy one in the store before he left mr duncan of course was glad to hear the result of his peculiar sentence and gave the man all possible encouragement in his determination to turn over a new leaf when some years later mr duncan was in victoria and one evening was trudging up the avenue on his way to bishop cridge's residence he was hailed by a man in a buggy who asked if he might offer him a ride mr duncan accepted and to his amazement recognized the quondam liquor seller he had given the queer sentence 
he learned that the man actually had become converted in the indian house at metlakahtla that he had abandoned the liquor peddling and had started a coal business at victoria where he had joined the methodist church of which he now was a prominent member holding a position of trust and rejoicing in being able to do some humble work in the lord's vineyard that was not however the way all liquor sellers brought before mr duncan turned out mr duncan once met one collins in victoria and told him that he had a warrant for him which had not been served but he said why do you not quit that business and go in for legitimate trade if you do and come up our way i not only will not have the warrant served but will help you all i can in your trade but if you will persist in your evil ways you had better keep out of my jurisdiction for if we catch you up there i will punish you to the full extent of the law that you may feel assured of the man promised before mr duncan returned collins had gone north when he came home he heard that the man had been at an indian camp not far from metlakahtla and sold liquor there was abundant proof of his new offence as he had already left the neighbourhood mr duncan sent his constables after him with the old warrant they brought him back why did you not keep your promise which you gave me in victoria i don't care anything about your old warrant neither do i i will not use that now here is a new charge against you and there are the witnesses the constable had brought the sloop along the sentence was five hundred dollars fine which was duly paid the sloop was confiscated and the liquor destroyed collins swore went back to victoria and bought a new sloop which he called duncan thus intending to throw contumely on the honoured name but he fared badly and died poor the trial of peter garkotitch came a good deal later in fact after mr duncan's return from his first tour to europe of which we shall hear later on on his return from england mr duncan made a short sojourn in victoria one evening he sat down at table in a restaurant with a german friend it was soon after the close of the franco-prussian war and this war was the subject of their discussion mr duncan happened to remark that he thought it was a just and proper ending to a war which france had had no business to declare as they were leaving a man at the next table who evidently wanted to pick a quarrel with them said you can crow now but the pope will be on top yet we did not speak to you sir answered mr duncan what do you mean anyway we have nothing to do with your pope as a gentleman you ought not to mix up in our conversation when we did not address you the man was peter garkotitch a slavonian trader he afterwards told mr duncan's agent in victoria that he was going to get even with duncan that he was going up to his island and make all his indians drunk the agent told him he'd better not do that as mr duncan would put him in jail for his trouble peter said he was not afraid either of duncan or the devil they would never get him several months later an indian told mr duncan that peter was at woodcock's landing ten miles or so from metlakahtla and that he was selling liquor to the indians do you know it yes sir i peeped through a hole in the tent when peter sold a bottle to another indian he gave me the bottle and i have brought it to you and the indian is along outside mr duncan issued a warrant and gave it to eli hamlet a dane who had married one of the metlakahtla indians and was then living in the settlement and asked him to take two indian constables with him and go and arrest peter six hours later the man returned threw the warrant down in front of mr duncan and said he would not serve it when peter had been informed that they had a warrant for him he had pulled a revolver and swore he would shoot any man who tried to arrest him don't say you will not arrest the man till you have heard me the majesty of the law must be maintained will you go if i show you that you can arrest him without any danger to your own life yes i will all right take four canoes and ten indians in each let each indian carry a loaded gun when you get within gunshot distance of him stand up in your canoe with the warrant in your hand don't you have a gun but have every one of the forty indians aim his gun at his head then cry to him hold up your hands without a weapon at once or my indians will shoot and riddle you with their bullets if he does not obey command fire if he does comply step forward and arrest him all right i will go everything went as the plan was laid four or five of his men were arrested and twenty-three casks of liquor taken 
peter fled up the river but they hauled in upon him in an hour or two and he surrendered gracefully it was nearly midnight when they arrived mr duncan mr duncan called peter there are two hundred indians after me they want to kill me you will be all right peter no one will kill you here said mr duncan put him in the jail till morning and have an indian stand guard over him and the liquor till then was the order to mr hamlet the next day he was brought into court and asked if he wanted any one present at his trial yes he mentioned some twelve or thirteen miners at the landing all right we will send for them but then we cannot have the trial till day after tomorrow this was so ordered and then the day of the trial came mr duncan told him that he was glad his friends were present so that they could see that he had a fair trial the two indians then testified conclusively to the sale duncan now turned to the defendant now pete do you want any one sworn to testify to your good character which i am frank to say would weigh quite a bit with me or to anything else for all that if so let me know yes sir i do i want to have harry white sworn first he knows me and my character very well sir be sworn harry white a big burly miner stepped forward was sworn kissed the book folded his arms over his breast and said with a great deal of pomposity well sir i have known pete for these many years he has been a respectable and honourable man sir and i always thought he had a good character until the other day sir when i found he sold liquor to the indians what do you say did you know him to do that i do sir yes you did pete and it's no use denying it i'm under oath now sir and i will tell the truth you cannot get me to lie for you pete do you want any other witnesses sworn i can well imagine the humorous twinkle in mr duncan's eyes as he put this question to the defendant no sir was pete's surly answer he was convicted of course and paid in spot cash the fine of five hundred dollars imposed unfortunately says mr duncan we could not confiscate the liquor as we could not prove it was brought up to sell to the indians against his positive assertion that it was brought here to sell to the miners pete therefore started away with his twenty-three casks of liquor but it did him no good he had to pack it at great expense over the divide into the interior when he arrived at his destination he applied to the gold commissioner for a license he however refused to grant him one as he had heard that he had been convicted before mr duncan mr duncan trumped up a case against me i know duncan sir he is an honest and conscientious man who trumps up no case against any man you can get no license here as he could not even get a permit to sell the liquor to some one else he was obliged to pack it back again as the liquor had not been paid for this transaction ruined him shortly afterwards he committed suicide the way of the transgressor is hard but it was when he tackled the hudson's bay company for selling liquor to the indians that mr duncan truly showed his grit no other man in the northwest province would have dared do it to accuse this honorable company and its honorable directors the very power behind the throne in the province of the most heinous offense then known to that country but they should soon find if they did not suspect it already that mr duncan was no respecter of persons or even of the mightiest corporation in the land among other not altogether excellent assistants which the church missionary society had from time to time sent him was an ex-prize fighter named cunningham who claimed to have been converted but whose conversion was not any deeper than that he on his way up to act as a missionary gambled away every cent he had mr duncan soon found him out and sent him about his business this was just the proper man for the company he could put them right with the indians so they picked him up and appointed him agent at fort simpson it was rumored about that liquor was being sold at the fort to the indians one of mr duncan's constables wholly on his own account and anxious to secure the moiety of the fine which the law allowed to the informer got a fort simpson indian to take a marten skin go into the fort and ask for a bottle of whiskey the assistant trader a norwegian hans bjornson by name sent him to the side door of the warehouse where cunningham came examined his skin and then gave a bottle to hans who in turn handed it to the indian who again brought it to the constable waiting outside the gate of the fort the evidence was not very strong 
the only corroboration of the indian who brought it being that of the constable that he saw him go into the fort with the skin and come out soon after without it and that he brought back a bottle which he was morally sure he did not have before he went in and of course there was the bottle the evidence not being very strong mr duncan preferred to summon mr cunningham and mr bjornson rather than to issue a warrant for them on the return day mr cunningham appeared but not mr bjornson mr duncan who had been informed by the constable that he had not served mr bjornson because mr cunningham had taken the copy of the summons for him and promised he would give it to him upon the opening of court said where is hans bjornson mr cunningham i don't know did you give him the summons you took from the constable no sir why not he did not come back before i left was he not in the fort when the constable was there no sir mr duncan who knew that this was false and had formulated his plan announced this case stands adjourned till to-morrow forenoon at eleven o'clock at which time you will appear again sir mr cunningham protested against this arbitrary adjournment but that was all the good it did him a warrant was at once issued for hans bjornson and the constables were ordered to proceed with all possible haste to serve it and to be sure to get to the fort before mr cunningham bring mr bjornson along with them and under no circumstances to allow mr cunningham to speak to him they started at once and soon hauled in on cunningham who suspecting something to be in the wind had hurried back seeing their canoe hurrying by cunningham tried to follow it fortunately a fog came in from the sea just then the constables noticing the other canoe following them changed their course and paddled with hard strokes out to sea after them as fast as he could go went cunningham when they thought they had got him sufficiently out of the right course they placed their paddles in the water noiselessly and stealthily but with heavy pulls steering their canoe in towards the land and reached fort simpson arrested hans bjornson and were a couple of miles on their way back when they met cunningham's canoe which had lost its bearings in the dense fog he tried to speak to bjornson but the constables knew their business and flew past him singing their canoe song so loudly that no one could get a word in edgewise arrived at metlakatla and brought before mr duncan hans bjornson fully and voluntarily admitted the transaction and said he wanted to plead guilty but mr duncan put him in a cell till the next morning when he was brought into court and confronted with cunningham who tried in vain to get into communication with him bjornson's case was called first and he pleaded guilty though cunningham tried by gestures and grimaces to have him stand trial cunningham denied everything but was convicted as mr duncan considered the indian story at least morally if not legally corroborated by the assistance plea of guilty as it was only one single transaction and the maximum fine five hundred dollars had to be apportioned between them at least that was the way mr duncan understood the law he fined cunningham four hundred and bjornson one hundred dollars which fines of course had to be paid before they were allowed to leave the courtroom the company afterwards sued out a writ of error but the conviction was held good and the hudson's bay company again had to acknowledge that it had met its master and its second waterloo in its fight with the lowly lay missionary of metlakatla end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf back in old england the following incident will show the wonderful influence mr duncan's personality exerted even over neighboring indians not belonging to his colony two white miners had been murdered by a party of indians a warship was dispatched to the village to compel the surrender of the murderers after a parley the indians gave up two of the three men implicated according to their notion of law and justice they had done all that could be required of them two lives had been lost and two were given up to satisfy the demands of the whites so even had their village been bombarded which the captain threatened to do it is questionable whether they would have gone any farther at least the ship left with only this partial result accomplished six months later the same warship came to metlakatla this time not on an errand of war but for the purpose of bringing the bishop of columbia to the village 
when it had signalled its arrival by firing a gun mr duncan came out in a canoe manned by ten indians by his side sat an indian who was not handling a paddle it was the murderer whom the heathen village had refused to surrender to the warship he was now mr duncan's prisoner some time after the warship had left having accidentally come under the spell of his preaching he went to mr duncan and said whatever you tell me to do i will do if you say i am to go on board the warship when it comes here again i will go mr duncan told him that was the only thing for him to do he allowed him to stay in the village on condition that he would give himself up when the next warship came up the coast when the gun sounded he could easily have escaped but true to his word he came to mr duncan and said the warship is here what must i do you must come with me as a prisoner so he did and was delivered to the captain to be taken south to be tried for his life what a ship of war with its belching cannon could not do the influence and power of the lowly missionary had accomplished at his trial it appeared that he had been compelled to take part in the murder through fear that he had from the first protested against the killing but as one of the others had killed the first man he driven by fear that his companions would turn on him had reluctantly joined in the killing of the second but had succeeded in saving the life of the third man under the circumstances he was pardoned afterwards he came to live at metlakahtla with his family and became a sincere and earnest christian in eighteen sixty four the rev r a doolan was sent out to mr duncan who advised him to start a mission among the nass river indians who at an earlier day had so thoroughly succeeded in arousing his interest in them after a short sojourn at metlakahtla he followed this advice and started a mission nation at kuanwak on the nass river he only remained three years during which time he went through many trying experiences and had many narrow escapes but in spite of the many difficulties which he had to overcome he laid the foundation for a great work which should bloom grandly after he left the field before being compelled to leave for england by reason of a death in his family he removed the mission station to kincolith heretofore mentioned in these pages this was done by him in conjunction with the rev r tomlinson a graduate of dublin university both an earnest and talented evangelical preacher and a practicing physician as well who arrived in metlakahtla from england in the year eighteen sixty seven given his choice as to whether he would remain at metlakahtla or take over the mission on the nass river he promptly chose the latter the fact was that his mind had while in victoria been thoroughly poisoned against mr duncan by the rev f gribble who with his wife and child had also come out to help mr duncan but who found that they could not stand it more than seven weeks i believe mrs gribble was the lady who when she was presented with a goose had to send for one of the indian women and have her teach her how to cook it of course that did not strengthen the confidence of the native women in her ability to take care of the training school where their daughters were by her to be initiated into the mysteries of housekeeping as practised by the whites mr tomlinson however after a few months found the stories which mr gribble had told him to be absolutely false and after overcoming his first prejudice became mr duncan's truest and best friend and the strongest and trustiest colleague he at any time has found in his labours he made a great success of the kincolith mission where he remained a faithful servant in the master's vineyard until eighteen seventy eight when he thought he saw a more fruitful field among some of the tribes living on the headwaters of the skeena river whose language he had mastered in eighteen sixty five mr duncan tore down his own old log house and erected on the point where it had stood and from where he had a full and unobstructed view of the two wings of the village which at this point came together as at the apex of a triangle the mission house so called a truly palatial building compared with what he had occupied up to that time it was a two-story structure sixty-four by thirty-two containing on the first floor seven large and airy rooms on the second floor was besides numerous other apartments the dormitory for the girls attending the training school which in spite of many vicissitudes caused by the poor female help continually sent him by the society had most of the time been carried on and with many evidences of god's especial blessing mr duncan at an early day advised his men who were inclined to turn christians not to marry any of the young women in the camp at fort simpson who had been taken to victoria 
and there exposed to the most degrading vices but to defer taking unto themselves wives until the girls in his mission training school were through with their education most of his young men followed this advice and to this day thank him for it for by doing so they secured bright well-educated christian wives who knew how to make the home pleasant and homelike and these very girls are today the prominent mothers and grandmothers of the best homes in the new village and an ornament to its society as well as to its church about this time the fire brigade of the village was organized consisting of six companies of ten members each there was now for years a slow but steady progress of the village in every particular of course there were drawbacks and difficulties even troubles sometimes there always are but mr duncan's words show how well he and his people knew how to meet them he writes in eighteen sixty eight the enemy is only permitted to annoy but not to destroy us only to make us stand more to our arms and to look more imploringly and continually to heaven nor is he permitted to triumph over us one joyful sign of spiritual progress was the formation of the young men to the number of one hundred or more into bible classes for the study of the word the young women of the training school at about the same time took charge of similar classes among the women young and old and often did the elders of the church and other earnest christian men go to fort simpson and to other neighboring tribes to bring to their heathen brethren the glad gospel message which had fired their own hearts a missionary spirit was over the people which testified greatly to their own christian sincerity and uprightness metlakatla was becoming what had always been mr duncan's wish a brilliant beacon light on the desolate northwest coast sending its splendid rays in all directions the guiding star of the heathen tribes towards the only port of safety and happiness on a rocky and dangerous coast but at this time mr duncan had further ambitions for the young settlement he writes the spirit of improvement which christianity has engendered among these people needs fresh material and knowledge in order to develop itself the sources of industry at present in the hands of the indians are too limited and inadequate to enable them to meet their increased expenditures as a christian and civilized community which is no longer able to endure the rude huts and half-nakedness of the savage again numbers of young men are growing up in the mission who want to work and work must be found for them or mischief will follow they will be drawn to the settlements of the whites where numbers of them will be sure to become the victims of the white man's vices and diseases he had now at the beginning of the year eighteen seventy been in the wilderness and among the savages over thirteen years the call of the homeland came upon him there he felt he could go and find out about and learn trades which again he could introduce to and teach the indians never had the time been so propitious for an absence necessarily much longer than a few hurried trips to victoria all the outings he so far had consumed the elders were well schooled and able to divide among them the people for smaller meetings in the houses every sunday the constables had had experience sufficient to teach them what was necessary and proper to do to maintain order the village council knew now what was expected of it there was a competent storekeeper in charge of the store and a good man running the sawmill he felt they had got so far now that with proper instructions they would be able to carry on the moral and temporal government of the village for a year he knew he could trust them and that they would feel proud and anxious to show themselves worthy of the confidence he was about to repose in them so on the twenty eighth day of january eighteen seventy he left his beloved metlakatla for a visit to old england what the departure of their beloved teacher meant to the natives and how attached they were to him were made fully apparent when he left though he had been to every house and bade them all an individual farewell when the time for his leaving came they gathered in knots on the beach for still another handshake and even after the last farewell and the last solemn prayer when they all knelt together on the sandy beach around him who had led them out into the light they could not allow him to board the ship alone but followed him in their canoes until the smoke from the steamer disappeared in the dim distance i have had access to the entry he made in his memorandum book before he left as to the different trades and occupations he intended to investigate and study and try to take back with him the requisite knowledge of from old england it reads as follows teasing carding spinning weaving cleaning dyeing drying 
wool making soap making brushes making baskets making rope making clogs making staves dressing deerskins making bricks making tiles gardening photography quite an ambitious undertaking it must be admitted for one man with about six months time to learn it all in mr duncan is a peculiar man and he acted peculiarly he came to beverly on a friday night one would think after nearly fourteen years absence he would rush to meet mother and relatives and friends and childhood acquaintances not so he he put up at an inn on the outskirts of the town saturday he spent wandering about a great deal of the time in the cemetery he wanted to observe the changes wrought and find out who the silent immigrants to the resting place for the dead were alone undisturbed by friendly greetings and joyous chatter the return to him was a solemn end to a solemn absence sunday he went towards the old chapel of ease st john's church where he had spent so many hours of devotion but as he neared it he saw a man he knew and though the beardless youth had returned a man with heavy full sandy whiskers he was afraid of a recognition which he did not desire yet and pretended to be busy wiping his face with his handkerchief as he passed by on the other side of the street the methodist church he thought was the only safe place for him to worship in that day towards evening he sought the residence of his former employer mr cousins who recognized him at once he kindly consented to go the next morning to prepare mr duncan's mother for his return the old lady would not believe it when he first suggested that her son was likely to return home very soon and mr cousins had to go a second time to assure her that she would see him that day before she could make up her mind that it was so while he needed rest very much after his assiduous labors he soon started on his round of learning the various trades he went to an old irish woman who for one shilling taught him the mysteries of the spinning wheel and then thought that a fortune had fallen to her to manchester for weaving carding etc of wool to yarmouth to learn rope making and how to construct rope walks and to other places to learn to make clogs or wooden soled shoes and cooperage and he learned all that he was to learn and learned it quickly he had extensive notes of every trade and each and every particular connected with it in his memorandum book nor did he forget photography he brought back with him a photographic apparatus plates and chemicals he was the first photographer on the northwest coast and many of the illustrations given in these pages from old metlakatla are from the photographic plates taken by mr duncan himself and these photographs used by the engraver for illustrating this book are now in many cases the only copies extant of his first efforts in an art in which nowadays almost every traveller considers himself an expert i must tell how he managed to get instruments for a brass band he had noticed that the natives though having no instruments except a primitive drum and the rattle were great singers had fine voices and a good ear for time and music he therefore made up his mind to get instruments for a brass band for them he inquired but found the price about five hundred dollars too high for him the music dealer who had become interested when he heard he wanted them for an indian mission band told him of a rich silk manufacturer who some time ago had purchased thirty instruments for a brass band for his workmen to play on but had got into some difficulty with them on account of an unwarranted strike and now kept the instruments locked up and perhaps would sell them at quite a discount mr duncan called on the manufacturer pardon me sir but i heard you had a set of brass band instruments i have what about it i was told you might sell them at a reasonable figure and as i wanted to buy a set what do you want them for mr duncan told him about his work and his indians the capitalist seemed to grow interested as he proceeded but when mr duncan had finished he said gruffly my instruments are not for sale sir all right said mr duncan i beg your pardon for intruding and taking up your time i said they were not for sale but that does not prevent my making you a present of them does it you may take them i hope you will have more joy from them than i have had from the ungrateful men i bought them for he now had the instruments but the next thing was how to teach the indians to play them 
after a short sojourn in san francisco where he was fortunate enough to secure at a cheap rate a set of looms and other machinery for a weaving plant from a manufacturer who intended to put improved machinery into his own factory he landed in victoria on his way home he there heard of a very fine music teacher he called on him and told him he wanted to learn the gamut of all the thirty pieces he had obtained for his band the teacher opened his eyes one man thirty pieces but i only have a very limited time how much time have you i leave here in eight days for the north the music teacher almost fainted away but he did not know his pupil mr duncan took eleven lessons paid him eleven dollars and when he was through he had learned the gamut of them all after he came home he called some of the young men together gave them the instruments showed them how to use them and told them to go out in the forest to practice them this they did and what a noise they made they came back after a couple of hours and told him that they knew how now he was not so sure he was not going to let them get away with the instruments anyhow so he made them hang them up on the wall in his office and come back another day and practice some more after a while he had succeeded in teaching them to play in a manner god save the queen later on he had a german machinist from victoria who was quite a musician come up to metlakatla he instructed the natives for three months that is all the instruction they have had from any white people the rest they have taught themselves and with what wonderful results will be shown later on he also at this time brought with him from victoria an organ which was placed in the church thus relieving his old concertina from further service end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. home again just a few days more than a year after leaving for england mr duncan returned to metlakatla on the twenty first of february eighteen seventy one if he had ever had any doubt of the affection with which the indians clung to him such doubt was very promptly dissipated by the manner in which he was received on his homecoming i prefer to let mr duncan describe it himself the news of my arrival at the mouth of the skeena river had travelled to metlakatla and on the following morning a large canoe arrived from there to fetch me home the happy crew whose hearts seemed brimful of joy at seeing me back gave me a very warm welcome i readily decided to leave the steamer and to proceed at once to metlakatla with my indian friends who assured me that the village was in a great state of excitement at the prospect of my return we were favored with a strong fair wind and with two sails up we dashed along merrily through a boiling sea i now felt that i was indeed homeward bound my happy friends having nothing to do but watch the sails and sit still could give free vent to their long pent-up feelings and so they poured out one piece of news after another in rapid succession and without regard to order or the changes their reports produced upon my feelings thus we had good and bad solemn and frivolous news all mixed indiscriminately on sighting the village in accordance with a preconcerted arrangement a flag was hoisted over our canoe as a signal to the villagers that i was on board very soon we could discern quite a number of flags flying over the village and indians hurrying towards the place of landing before we reached the beach large crowds had assembled to greet me on my stepping out of the canoe bang went a cannon and when fairly on my feet bang went another then some of the principal people stepped away from the groups and came forward hats off and saluted me warmly on my advancing the corps of constables discharged their muskets then all hats were doffed and a general rush to seize my hand ensued i was now hemmed in by the crowds of solemn faces many exhibiting intense emotion and eyes glistening with tears of joy in struggling my way to the mission house i had nearly overlooked the school children the dear little ones had been posted in order on one side and were standing in mute expectation of a recognition i patted a few on the head and then with my feelings almost overcome i pressed my way to my house how sweet it was to find myself again in my own little room 
and sweeter still to thank god for all his persevering care over me as numbers of the people were pressed into and crowding my house i ordered the church bell to be rung at once they hurried to the church and when i entered it it was filled such a sight after a minute's silence we joined in thanksgiving to god after which i addressed the assembly for about twenty minutes this concluded i set off accompanied by several leading christian men to visit the sick and very aged who i was told were anxiously begging to see me the scenes that followed were very affecting many assured me that they had constantly prayed to god to be spared to see me once again and god had answered their prayers and revived their hearts after much weeping on finishing my visits i made up doses of medicine for several of the sick and then sat down for a little refreshment again my house becoming crowded i sat down with about fifty for a general talk i gave them the special messages from christian friends which i had down in my notebook told them how much we were prayed for by many christians in england and scanned over the principal events of my voyage and doings in england we sat till midnight but even then the village was lighted up and the people all waiting to hear from the favoured fifty what i had communicated many did not go to bed at all but sat up all night talking over what they had heard such a brief account of my reception at metlakatla i could but reflect on how different this was to the reception i had among the same people in eighteen fifty seven then they were all superstitiously afraid of me and regarded with dread suspicion my every act it was with feelings of fear and contempt they approached me to hear god's word and when i prayed among them i prayed alone none understood none responded now how things have changed love has taken the place of fear and light the place of darkness and hundreds are intelligently able and devoutly willing to join me in prayer and praise to almighty god to god be all the praise and glory any amount of work was now before him the spiritual part of course naturally first occupied his attention then there were the sick who needed medicine and advice again the constables urged upon him an examination and readjudication of the law cases which the council had settled temporarily and strangely enough there was only one of these cases in which mr duncan found it necessary to modify their rulings and decisions there were thirteen marriages to celebrate and then the new improvements were to be planned and laid out and started sixty men were set to work at once a rope walk was built also a building for the weaving enterprise a shop for the clog manufacturing a cooper's shop and a sash and door shop and soon the wheels of industry were humming in the little village of more especial interest to us is the weaving industry the women with their spinning wheels on which the mountain sheep's wool was spun have been immortalized in the illustration from a photograph taken by mr duncan on a nearby page a number of others were engaged at the looms fair wages were paid the workers and excellent work turned out a specialty was made of shawls which the older women always wore outside of the house i have examined some of these shawls now in the stock of the store at new metlakatla and must acknowledge that the workmanship seems to me excellent it is claimed that they could not wear them out the ground for the magnificent new church building to be erected later on was after a while cleared and drained logs were cut and rafted to the mill for the heavy framework of this extensive building and soon the men in the sash and door shop found themselves busy preparing a stock not only for the church but also for the new buildings of the village for the people had on the advice of mr duncan determined to rebuild their village in a more substantial manner but it took time to accomplish all these improvements it was not until christmas eighteen seventy four that the splendid new church with a seating capacity of about twelve hundred could be dedicated to the master's use and the year eighteen seventy eight was well under way before mr duncan could report that the natives with a donation from him of sixty dollars for each house had replaced their old temporary dwellings with eighty-seven new substantial double houses of two stories each provided with windows chimneys and other civilized improvements the building lots each sixty by one hundred twenty had been laid out by him and were now neatly fenced in and contained flower and berry gardens in the front and vegetable gardens in the rear 
in short the little village commenced to assume the substantial and cosy appearance of a new england town the church at the cost of over twelve thousand dollars was erected wholly by voluntary contributions partly from the natives themselves and partly from personal friends and admirers of mr duncan the balance was provided from the profits of the trading enterprises of the village not one dollar of its cost was contributed from the funds of the church missionary society footnote in eighteen eighty five mr duncan showed that up to that time the total amount received by him in the way of donations from friends was less than six thousand dollars the total sum expended by him up to the same time for the erection of the splendid church edifice establishing industries plants and buildings village improvements roves wharves etc and in aid given to the natives in building their new dwellings was nearly thirty five thousand dollars a most marvellous result of a rare business capacity in a preacher End footnote. some time later was completed the building of the two-story schoolhouse containing a large auditorium with a seating capacity of about eight hundred at times when a large number of the people were away on fishing expeditions this room was used for church purposes that he had not one moment's rest all day and many a time if not all the time had to encroach upon the hours of the night in order to get his work out of the way will be apparent when we for a moment consider his varied occupations and duties preacher pastor schoolmaster doctor magistrate chief of police mayor manager of a store a sawmill and of half a dozen other manufacturing establishments church builder and architect bookkeeper gardener and adviser and arbiter of every little trouble and dispute arising between nine hundred to a thousand people only one degree removed from savagery indeed sufficient was all this to turn half a dozen heads if they did not sit as squarely on a pair of yorkshire shoulders as mr duncan's did it was not until november eighteen seventy three that mr duncan after his first removal to metlakahtla had any assistance in any part of this work worthy of the name at this time mr w h collison came from england as a schoolmaster he was accompanied by his worthy wife and they entered upon the discharge of their new and difficult duties with great ardor and zeal the girls school under mrs collison's management especially attained new life and the fruits of this part of the work became promptly apparent they continued as mr duncan's trusted assistants at metlakahtla to a great extent relieving him of his duties as schoolmaster at least until the year eighteen seventy six when they were in their turn relieved by mr and mrs h shute who had been sent out in order to allow the collisons to take up missionary work among the haidas at masset on graham island the largest of the group of the queen charlotte islands where they were permitted to see very gratifying fruits of a work extending over the greater part of three years mr and mrs shute continued their work at metlakahtla for several years mrs shute was a conscientious and painstaking woman for whom mr duncan has nothing but praise her husband does not however seem to have been of any particular benefit the picture of the beautiful christian tone which the life of the natives attained under the spiritual administration of mr duncan would not be complete without giving a little pen sketch from the hand of the venerable archdeacon woods from victoria who in the year eighteen seventy one visited the christian settlements of metlakahtla and kincoleth he describes what took place on his trip up to nass river whither he went in a canoe manned by metlakahtla indians having paddled from daylight till dusk with a brief rest of about half an hour we reached the only available camping ground on the coast where we rested for the night under such shelter as the canoe sail stretched across the mass could afford and having lighted a fire i prepared supper mr duncan had provided me with food ready cooked so my supper was soon made and i laid down to rest wearied with sitting all day in the canoe the indians cooked their venison and salmon indian fashion and then all reverently taking off their caps one said grace with every appearance of devotion after supper i was amused at the evident fun that was going on amongst them for though i could not understand their language a laugh is understood all over the world by and by as i was dropping to sleep i was aroused by their sudden stillness my first impression was that they were getting wearied but it was not so 
they were only calming down before retiring for rest and soon i observed them all with their heads uncovered and reverently bowed kneel around the campfire while one said prayers for all and as the lord's prayer for i could recognize it in the strange language in which it was clothed ascended from beneath the shades of the forest from lips which only lately had acquired the right to say our father i could not fail to realize how grandly catholic is that prayer which he himself gave to those to whom alone he gives the right to use it it is only natural that mr duncan in his work should come into serious contact with the heathen indians surrounding metlakahtla on the question of slavery which we have seen was practiced to a great extent among the indians of the coast it goes without saying that no slaves were allowed to be kept in bondage at metlakahtla the christ had of course made them all free but this was not sufficient for mr duncan or his christian natives they considered it their christian duty to help free from bondage any slaves belonging to neighboring indians whom they could reach for the purpose of purchasing slaves their freedom the sum of five thousand dollars was from time to time set aside from the profits of the trading establishments and the greater portion of it used whenever any slaves reached metlakahtla it meant freedom forever no cruel master was allowed to reclaim them from that city of christian freedom to what extent metlakahtla became to these poor slaves all over alaska and british columbia a city of refuge will be apparent from the following penned by mr duncan in the year eighteen seventy six a poor slave woman still young in years who had been stolen away when a child and carried to distant tribes in alaska territory where she had suffered many cruelties fled from her oppressors last summer and though ill at the time took to the sea in a canoe all alone and determined to reach metlakahtla or perish in the attempt on her way she had upwards of one hundred and fifty miles to travel she was seen and taken by a party of fort simpson indians who would no doubt have been glad to hand her back to her pursuers for gain but on hearing of her case i demanded her freedom and finally she was received into a christian family here and tenderly cared for both the man and his wife who received her into their home had themselves been slaves years ago they understood her language sympathized deeply with her and labored hard to impart to her the knowledge of the savior of sinners after three months her cruel master with his party came here to recapture her but they had to return home unsuccessful in three months more her strength succumbed to the disease which had been brought on her by cruelty and hardship she was a great sufferer during the last few weeks of her life but she died expressing her faith in the saviour and rejoicing that she had been led here to end her days end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil shemp notable visitors in eighteen seventy five mr duncan found it necessary in order to protect the indians of british columbia generally from the attacks on their ancient rights by the white land grabbers to take a trip to ottawa canada where he laid before the dominion government the outrageous legislation adopted by british columbia and log rolled through its legislature by the land grabber lobby by which it was intended to allow the indians only ten acres of forest and rock for each family in lieu of their old ancestral rights and privileges of which they were now by law to be deprived he insisted that it was the duty of the dominion government to protect the indians from this onslaught on their rights and succeeded in persuading the government that failure so to do might and likely would result in an indian uprising the consequences whereof could only be contemplated with horror fear and trembling this attack of the white land grabbers was thanks to his efforts thus frustrated but they should again be heard from they always are his visit drew the attention of the officers of the dominion government upon metlakahtla and the great work which the little talented and resourceful yorkshire missionary had accomplished it was undoubtedly the main cause of the visit of lord dufferin the then governor-general of the dominion to metlakahtla on the thirtieth of august eighteen seventy six 
he came in a warship accompanied by lady dufferin and his suite and received a truly royal welcome though his coming was wholly unexpected and unheralded and therefore the greater portion of the villagers were denied the privilege of meeting him as they at the time were away putting in their winter supply of salmon an address very likely prepared by mr duncan was read and presented by david leask one of mr duncan's aptest and brightest scholars on behalf of the native council and the governor-general who with his lady was most agreeably surprised at what they saw accepted the address in a fine speech in which he pledged the indians the protection of the government and its most gracious queen and paid the highest encomium on the work which mr duncan had done among and for them interesting as this visit proved to the mission and the indians a greater treat was still in store for them captain then admiral prevost who had been under god the means of starting this wonderful work among the indians on the eighteenth day of june eighteen seventy eight paid metlakahtla a long promised visit for he had promised mr duncan and the society that he while stationed on the coast would make frequent visits to mr duncan at his mission station but in the busy whirl of the life of the squadron he had forgotten it or been prevented from keeping his promise during the dark days through which mr duncan had striven in the desperate struggles to which he at first was exposed there was no telling what help a visit from a christian captain sailing his man-of-war would have proven to the young missionary but during these dreary years when he was peering through the fog for the union jack and the standard of the captain he looked in vain for a help that after all would have been only of the earth earthly perhaps it was better so maybe it turned his heart and his thoughts with greater fervour to the helper who could do greater wonders and who had stood by him in so many an hour of need one thing is certain if the feeling that this visit which had been promised to be made in times when he needed it so sorely had been deferred to a time when he was on top when his sailing was plain and the cause of christ was and had for years been triumphant in any manner embittered mr duncan's thoughts he did not in the least let it interfere with the hearty welcome extended to the visiting admiral whom he cordially introduced to his people as the father of their mission the sight which met their visitor must have sufficed to dim the bravest eye must have filled the most callous heart with gratitude to god for having been allowed even in the smallest measure to share in the responsibility for such glorious results i will let the admiral himself describe what he saw and felt the sunday he spent in metlakahtla to me all days at metlakahtla are solemnly sacred but sunday of all others especially so canoes are all drawn up on the beach above high water mark not a sound is heard the church bell rings and the whole population pour out from their houses men women and children to worship god in his own house built by their own hands as it had been remarked no need to lock doors for no one is there to enter the empty houses such is the deep attention of many present that having once known their former lives i know that the love of god shed abroad in their hearts by the holy ghost can alone have produced so marvellous a change first there was a very old woman staff in hand stepping with such solemn earnestness after her came one who had been a very notorious gambler though now almost crippled with disease yet he seemed to forget infirmity and literally to be leaping along next followed a dissipated youth now reclaimed and after him a chief who had dared a few years ago to proudly lift his hand to stop the work of god and now with humbled mane wending his way to worship then came a once still more haughty man of rank and after him a mother carrying her infant child and a father leading his infant son a grandmother with more than a mother's care watching the steps of her little grandson then followed a widow then a young woman who had been snatched from the jaws of infamy then a once notorious chief and the last i reflected upon was a man walking with solemn gait yet with hope fixed in his look when a heathen he was a murderer he had murdered his own wife and burnt her to ashes 
what are all these now i thought and the crowds that accompanied them whither are they going and what to do blessed sight for angels oh the preciousness of a saviour's blood if there is a joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth with what delight must angels gaze on such a sight as this i felt such a glow of gratitude to god come over me that my heart was stirred within me for who could have joined such a congregation as this in worship and have been cold and who could have preached the gospel to such a people and not have felt that he was standing where god was working before leaving metlakatla admiral prevost made the village a present of a set of street lamps a gift which was greatly appreciated both by mr duncan and the villagers another symbol of the light which metlakatla was spreading throughout the darkness surrounding it before these street lamps were installed mr duncan had contrived a very original way of lighting the streets and the church as well he caused each indian to erect a post with a crossbeam outside of his house from which was suspended an oil lamp fed by oolacan oil when the time came for divine service on winter evenings every householder detached the lamp from the beam and used it for lighting the way of the family to the church arrived at church the lamps were placed on the organ on the pulpit and on tables so as to light up the church as all the people were at church there was of course no need of street lamps during that hour upon returning from church the lamps again did service in lighting the streets and the entrance to the houses another very interesting visit to metlakatla must be recorded that of the late right reverend william g bompas the venerable and beloved missionary bishop of athabasca who arrived in november eighteen seventy seven and remained for nearly five months but before giving the details of that visit it is necessary to retrospect a little mr duncan though himself a member of the anglican church had always considered that his mission was to make christians out of the indians not merely episcopalians these his views had been cordially shared by the church missionary society as long as the venerable and evangelical rev henry venn was its general secretary and virtual head he fully approved of mr duncan's work as well as of his methods in the society's published reports of the metlakatla mission mr duncan's praises were for years sung without stint when he practically failed to use among his people the ritual of the church and abstained for weighty reasons from admitting them to the lord's supper no word of criticism was heard but upon the death of mr venn a more churchly spirit began to dominate the society and it for the first time even suggested that the mission should be turned into an episcopal church with the full administration of the sacraments of the church already as far back as eighteen sixty seven bishop hills had urged upon mr duncan to take orders but he definitely declined to do so the argument which he advanced was that when the jews were delivered out of egypt and were to be brought to the promised land it was moses who was no ordained priest who was their deliverer not the priest aaron i prefer in an humble way he said to be the moses of these poor people rather than an aaron god has granted his blessing to my humble work when i went among them only as a lay missionary preaching jesus christ and him crucified and nothing else i am not so sure that he would grant me the same blessing were i to appear in any other capacity again he said to the bishop ought i to be ordained when i really look upon the priestly orders as far as they apply to me at least as saul's armour was to david no protection but really a hindrance and an encumbrance i prefer to stick to the sling and the stone that has done good work so far let it continue mr duncan undoubtedly believed that the true reason for the bishops urging him to become ordained was that he desired the mission to become a full-fledged episcopal church of the regular connection and the indians to become episcopalians which mr duncan honestly believed was not the best for their christian life and growth but it must be admitted that in this it is at least possible that mr duncan is mistaken inasmuch as considerable inconvenience and extra labor devolving upon the clergy of the columbian diocese would necessarily be obviated by having an ordained priest in charge of the work at metlakatla who could lawfully administer the sacraments or in any event the ordinance of baptism 
on the other hand it is barely possible that mr duncan's strong prejudice against ritualism vestments altars and all the paraphernalia of the churchly church made in his mind more pernicious by the importance placed upon them by the high church element had considerable to do with his refusal to entertain the bishop's proposition to ordain him as a priest it is a fact worthy of notice in this connection that his only really true and faithful friend and colleague in the missionary work on the coast mr tomlinson though ordained a deacon when he first came out has ever since adopted the same policy and declined to receive full priestly orders when it was ascertained by the society that there was no prospect of mr duncan receiving orders its officers bent their every energy to secure the services of an ordained priest who could come out and be the pastor of the church at metlakahtla whether with a view of thereby superseding mr duncan or not is not perfectly clear to my mind i would rather be inclined to think however that there was no such intention at this time both because the society could not possibly close its eyes to the wonderful work which he had done and also because i know it to be a fact that it was held out to mr duncan presumably with the full knowledge of the society that when he was first ordained the next step would be to have him consecrated bishop of a missionary diocese on the northwest coast had mr duncan aspired to power and authority the way was here open for him to the fullest extent but he spurned the tempter and the temptation and went about his old simple unpretentious ways working day and night for the full redemption spiritual and temporal of his beloved metlakahtla indians a report reached victoria in the spring of eighteen seventy seven that the fort rupert indians had carried away as a slave an indian woman from the nanaimo reservation the vancouver island government dispatched the warship plumper to the indian village the captain sent word to the indians that unless they brought the indian woman on board within forty-eight hours he would destroy their village he did not desire to kill them and they could therefore leave but the village must be bombarded unless his request was complied with the indians as was generally their custom waited up to within half an hour of the time limit fixed by the captain they then sent word to him that they wanted to see him on shore when the captain came to meet them they had gathered some little distance from the beach one muscular strong indian approached dancing to the beach swinging a big knife violently above his head when he had come directly in front of the captain but some little distance back from the beach where the latter stood near his boat he came to a stop and with a violent swing stuck his knife deep into the sand he then made a speech wherein he said why did the whites let duncan pass by these indians when he went with the letter of god up the coast why did they not send duncan to us and make us good but no no to us they only send ships to kill us now then kill me at once i am the chief of this village there is the knife kill me and let my people go in peace so saying he pointed to the knife and bared his breast the captain answered him that he had no desire to kill any one of them if they delivered up the slave woman this they finally did at the last moment the captain returned to his ship and wrote his report to the authorities in this report he had just suggested that if some duncan could be sent to these indians instead of warships it would be a decided improvement when mr duncan himself who happened to pass by the place dropped into the cabin of the plumper informed of what had happened and what the captain had just been writing he went ashore and addressed the indians to whom he suggested that he might perhaps come to them himself within many moons to tell them the glad message of the blessed saviour this gave great joy to the hearts of the indians who never could understand why duncan had passed them by in the first place at this very time mr duncan had really made up his mind to leave metlakahtla and give up the work there to a young clergyman the rev a j hall whom the society had prevailed upon to come out he felt that the way the society was now constituted there was perhaps no hope of his in the long run successfully resisting the organizing of the mission into an episcopal church as he did not want to be a party to a step the fatal consequences of which to his devoted life work he could not help but foresee he had made up his mind to turn over metlakahtla to mr hall upon his arrival and to go somewhere else to start another mission work in another field 
he now looked upon this particular incident as a pointer from the lord as to the field upon which he ought to concentrate his labours when mr hall arrived on the sixth of august eighteen seventy seven mr duncan installed him and left for victoria there to mature his plans for the future but meantime without any final leave-taking with the indians he felt it was better thus a declaration that they would then see him for the last time might result in their revolting against the society's plans and against the priest whom it had sent them mr duncan desired to put no hindrances in their way and left them in full possession of the field to do what their consciences allowed them to now it so happened that mr hall though in many ways a gifted man and burning with an earnest zeal for christian work of which his many years of devoted service in the mission field of the northwest coast bear evidence was at the time lacking in the wisdom and experience which he undoubtedly later on acquired he did not know the indians as the old tried moses who had brought them out from the thraldom of heathen darkness into the glorious sunshine of christianity he did not understand how they had to be taken and just where the hidden shoals and rocks of their christian life were situated only a few weeks after the old leader had left metlakahtla he heard in victoria that a rumor had come down by one of the steamers that angels had appeared at metlakahtla upon inquiry as to what that could mean he ascertained from a certain party at victoria that he had received a letter from the rev mr crosby a methodist minister at fort simpson wherein he thanked god for the good work now going on at metlakahtla mr duncan knew crosby he was a well-meaning and able man but very impulsive and emotional a veritable shouter of the shouters who had managed to get some of the indians at fort simpson into what almost amounted to a religious frenzy mr duncan therefore thought he well knew what the nature of the work going on at metlakahtla must be when crosby felt inclined to thank god for it he knew in his heart that something was going wrong and that the results of his life work were in danger of being lost forever in the bog of religious fanaticism his friends in victoria urged him to go up at once and take hold of the mission again in order to save it from destruction after much urging he went he came just in time to save the situation the young priest had in his inexperience preached to the indians on this text from joel the prophet your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions in the exuberance of his youthful enthusiasm he had painted to them the scene vividly and impressionably the imagery of the poetic native was appealed to that was all but it was enough inside of a day or two some of them went out into the forest and saw angels and devils and i don't know what else mr crosby had come from fort simpson and fanned the flame with his own violence of speech motions gestures and eloquence he encouraged the crazy visions and the fanatic life in short mr duncan on his arrival found things in a terrible turmoil so far had things gone that one man had even imagined he had heard the holy ghost whisper to him get up go out wake up the village call it to a meeting in the church at midnight to hear the spirit speak he so did and there had actually been a well-attended meeting in fear and trembling in the church at midnight mr duncan arrived at the village on a saturday night after talking the matter over with two trusted elders of the church who came to him he took command just as if he had never left and as if there was no one else in charge he gave orders that there should be no church on the morrow then that the men should meet him in the schoolhouse in the morning and the women in the afternoon when the morning came all the men were on hand he gave them a good talking to and told them that he had found out about the immorality that had been practised called it plainly the devil's work among them and finally announced that there would be service in the church in the evening and that all could come who were sorry for what had happened but he did not want any one there who had encouraged this crazy fanatical deviltry when they went out he noticed some of them looking very glum and made up his mind that they were the ringleaders one of the elders at noon came in a great huff and told him that one of the former chiefs had sent word around to the women not to go to the meeting in the afternoon what shall we do he asked do nothing they will come anyhow so they did they were all there 
it was plain to see that they had taken no part in the excesses except so far as a few had been in good faith duped when he had finished his speech one of them rose and said it was simply awful what had been going on but that they were glad he was back everything would now be all right at the evening service the church was filled but the men who had looked so glum were not there he knew now positively that he had spotted the ringleaders the next morning he called them to the office and told them they were the ones to blame that they had been doing the devil's work and ought to be ashamed of themselves that they were puffed up and loved notoriety that was the secret they knew well that they had been lying but loved to fool the people as the old medicine men did one of them had the courage to say you are mistaken sir we had revelations revelations fiddlesticks came from the old leader in impatience then turning to the young priest who was present mr hall is this god's work to his credit be it said the young man without hesitation answered right to their faces no sir i am sorry to say that it is not mr duncan then told them not to dare to come to the church they were doomed to stay away from the service of god's people he wanted nothing more to do with them till they came back like the prodigal son repentant for their sins and ready to acknowledge that they had simply been the devil's tools shamefaced they sneaked out of the office one by one a short time after this occurrence bishop bompas arrived he had been requested by bishop hills to visit metlakahtla as the latter did not desire to become reconciled to dean cridge as the indians had suggested and did not want to irritate them by visiting them without complying with their request when this trouble was laid before bishop bompas he decided that metlakahtla was no place for a novice even if he was clothed in the full vestments of the priest and advised that mr duncan take up the work again as before mr duncan now suggested to mr hall that he go to fort rupert among the heathen there travel around and preach the gospel among them till some one accepted the word and then move them away and start a new metlakahtla the young priest with true christian meekness accepted the advice and threw himself with great ardor into the work the church missionary society approved of this course but when bishop ridley of whom more anon arrived on the scene he located mr hall at alert bay where some white people who had started a cannery had promised to help the mission along this promise they kept by ringing the cannery bell for work sundays when mr hall rang his church bell for services bishop bompas who had been relied upon by the society and bishop hills to revolutionize things at metlakahtla by turning the mission into an episcopal church and by introducing the sacrament of the lord's supper there after investigating matters thoroughly decided that under existing conditions it was not the best thing to do the old evangelical divine a genuine disciple of his great master though he had been induced to don a bishop's robes could not be made to play church politics at the risk of destroying and undermining the wonderful christian work he found in full blossom at the beautiful inlet of the north pacific and after having confirmed one hundred twenty four of the natives baptized many and ordained mr collison a priest he departed leaving with the wonderful lay missionary and his christian community the blessing of a true christian metlakahtla he left as he found it a second edition of the beautiful garden of eden but with no serpent in it the time was to come however when the serpent should appear to blast its happiness and beauty with his fetid breath End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w r tander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf troubles brewing while bishop hills of columbia in eighteen seventy nine was in england his diocese was divided into three out of it was carved among others the missionary diocese of caledonia which consisted of the mission fields in the northern portion of british columbia in which there were then all told three clergymen and one lay preacher mr duncan in return for the doubtful privilege of nominating the incumbent the church missionary society undertook to pay the salary of the bishop of this new diocese the rev william ridley who had been a missionary in india for a couple of years but had returned on account of failing health 
and obtained a living in england was consecrated bishop of this diocese on july twenty fifth eighteen seventy nine designated metlakahtla as the episcopal seat of his see and arrived in the little indian village on the first day of november eighteen seventy nine that day was a black letter day for the village and for the mission which had so successfully been carried on within its gates at first the bishop was all smiles and pleasantry he had nothing but kind words for the place the work the christian indians and their wonderful teacher in his first speech to the indians he assured them that he had not come to interfere with mr duncan but would willingly work with him this of course was just as it ought to be considering the wonderful monument to christianity and civilization this lone man had there reared but it was not long before the true nature of the hierarch asserted itself knowing mr duncan's antipathy to all sorts of clerical show and vestments he made it nevertheless a point to appear arrayed in his full episcopal regalia when in church on sundays where he had nothing to do but to sit in a pew like any other attendant as he could neither preach nor pray so that the natives could appreciate his efforts his claim to the title and address of my lord was of course just as offensive to the simple and lowly layman then he commenced to mildly suggest some improvement in the service a little more of the ritual and he had not been there many months before mr duncan received very broad hints that it was essentially wrong to deprive these poor christians of the great advantages of the sacrament of the lord's supper as he had argued to the society so he now told the bishop the reasons why he had hitherto with the full approval of the leading members of his church abstained from admitting them to the sacrament whether we agree with him or not in his reasons it must certainly be admitted that he knew the indians better than both the society and the bishop possibly could and that for this reason if for no other his opposition to such an important innovation in their worship could not in all fairness be easily brushed aside his reasons were as follows one not so long ago these indians had at least assumed the appearance of cannibals they had been taught this practice to be a most atrocious and heinous sin now when told they were to partake of the body and blood of the blessed saviour how could they with their limited reasoning capacity be expected to distinguish between the two acts would it not at least be liable to bring back to their minds the terrible custom and give the scoffers among them an opportunity to taunt them with their inconsistency Two then there was always the danger that they in their ignorance might come to look upon the sacrament as a charm which would take away their sins and be a passport to heaven their former training and ideas would easily foster such a belief three again there was this inconsistency which would strongly appeal to them and to them seem inexplicable the queen's law forbade any man to give an indian any wine and punished him for doing so now the church would give it to him and it was not wrong four with the inordinate appetite of all the indian for all intoxicating liquors there was special danger in offering him wine in the sacrament they might seek frequent admission to the sacrament for the very opportunity which it afforded them to a limited extent to cater to this appetite the unconverted heathen would certainly look upon it as a covert indulgence in what the law forbade five the law treated the indians as children it forbid them drinking liquors and punished them for doing so it was never the contemplation of the christian church that any one who had not attained further than the estate of children should partake of this sacrament hence they were not as a matter of analogy yet sufficiently mature to receive it the bishop was also in favor of a more liberal administration of the ordinance of baptism mr duncan had very decided views on this subject also in fact all his views were decided that was the make-up of the man it was one of the secrets of his success he had always insisted that no adult should be baptized until after a long probation and that no children should be baptized at all unless they first had christian parents secondly that the parents in asking for their baptism acted upon religious grounds and thirdly that they were reasonably competent to discharge their religious duties towards them 
there was in his opinion always the danger that the half-savage mind would harbour an idea that the holy ordinance and that alone was equivalent to an insurance policy of salvation others had not been so conscientious in their dealings with the indians some years before mr duncan had called before him a half-breed chief alfred dudeward from fort simpson he had just been initiated into the mysteries of the cannibal club and mr duncan notified him that if he ever repeated this heathenish tomfoolery he would send him to jail as it was a crime under the law to expose one's person in a state of nudity on the beach this scared him so that he a short time after went to victoria judge of mr duncan's surprise when he some time later read in a pamphlet published by a revivalist named hammond that this same half-breed had converted five hundred bloodthirsty savages and that he had come down to victoria for a methodist preacher to come up and baptize them this was really done by a preacher named pollard who came up and baptized these indians men women and children without first teaching them the word and without knowing anything about these people who were really still savages and to whom he thus lightly affixed the label of christianity the state of the christian understanding of these people is characterized by the fact that some of them right after their baptism affixed a sign to the door of their houses reading i am a methodist bishop ridley would have done well in adopting mr duncan's caution in regard to the administration of this sacrament if he had he would not have had the following experience most ludicrous if it was not so closely bordering on the sacrilegious one of the chief medicine men on the nass river was very sick in fact near death bishop ridley heard of it went to him and asked him if he did not desire to be saved the word he used was one which in their language is equivalent to our healed made well again of course he did yes certainly then he must give up his rattle well he thought he would be willing to do a small thing like that if he could only get well so he gave up his rattle to the bishop who carried it off as a trophy after having baptized the old heathen but the old medicine man did not get well in fact he actually got worse he called in his wise men they told him that he had made a mistake in giving up his rattle that was his power he grew worse and worse finally he made up his mind to get the rattle back again at whatever cost he found out that the bishop had sent to the creek for water to baptize him with so he sent for a bowl of water from the creek himself and placed it by his bedside then he summoned the bishop when the bishop arrived he told him that he had fooled him his lordship tried to argue with him but he would not listen he only wanted his rattle back the bishop would not give it up but when the old indian made use of threatening language it scared him and he finally said that though he would not give it back to him he might compromise by agreeing to give it back to the man's wife when he had sent for it and the old medicine man would not let him go till he had done this he handed the rattle to the man's wife as he now was about to depart the old indian grabbed the bowl of water threw it at the bishop and said take your water back too i don't want it after that he got better there was no danger that anything like that would ever have happened to mr duncan but he was not a bishop only a common layman missionary so of course the wisdom god had given him and his long experience among these people counted for nothing against the notions of a high priest of the church the bishop could however easily perceive that against a man of his firmness he could not have his way so he concluded to bide his time and undermine him with the society if he could mr duncan in a short time had an opportunity to find out the lay of the land the bishop came into his room one day in a great stew he had heard that the methodists were going to start a mission at hazelton away up on the skeena river the church must come in on the ground first and stop them so he immediately dispatched a young schoolmaster from metlakatla to the place with a blackboard in order to start a school for the natives and hold the fort until a priest could arrive the next move was to write mr tomlinson and order him to give up his mission where he had inaugurated a blessed work and go post haste to relieve the young man with the blackboard mr tomlinson did not believe in this kind of practice any more than mr duncan did so he refused to comply with the order of the bishop 
went home to england as fast as steam could carry him laid the matter before the society was sustained in his position and returned with an order from headquarters reversing the bishop's disposition of him the next move on the bishop's part was to take mr hall from the work he had started at mr duncan's suggestion itinerating around fort rupert and to place him at alert bay where nothing could be accomplished because of the contaminating presence of the whites mr duncan wrote to the society about this change in the work and the bishop was again overruled but disregarding the society's orders he continued the erection of mission buildings at alert bay and retained mr hall at that place where experience even to this day has shown that no satisfactory results could be obtained footnote when i in the summer of nineteen o eight came down the inside passage in company with mr hall what was my surprise to find upon our arrival at alert bay where the steamer put in in order to land the priest that an old-time potlatch with painted faces indians singing and dancing was in full swing End footnote. these experiences undoubtedly opened the eyes of the society to the fact that the appointment of bishop ridley was not such an unmitigated success after all and perhaps was the direct cause of a new order promulgated at the beginning of the year eighteen eighty one to the effect that the missionaries clergymen and laymen should meet annually at metlakatla under the presidium of the bishop for a conference which should determine as to the work at the different mission stations of the diocese this conference met for the first time in july eighteen eighty one the bishop for some reason best known to himself absented himself from these meetings and was skulking in his tent until the conference had adjourned when he somehow managed to do some work which i prefer not to characterize but which should tell thereafter it cannot sufficiently be regretted that the society should have made such a mistake in the man appointed to this missionary diocese had a man been selected of the splendid and upright character and with the loving and christian disposition exhibited by his successor in the diocese the right reverend f duvernay there is no question that the glorious work at old metlakatla never would have been interfered with and that god's church would not have been scandalized as it was in the years to follow the membership of this first conference of the workers of the northwest coast mission was made up of the clergymen tomlinson collison and hall mr duncan lay missionary and messieurs shoot and chantrell schoolmasters the conference desired to have mr duncan preside over its deliberations but as he peremptorily declined giving as a reason that he desired to absent himself when they discussed and voted upon the disposition of the metlakatla mission mr tomlinson was elected temporary chairman in the absence of the bishop and mr collison secretary after all the business relating to the various other stations had been disposed of the future of metlakatla was taken up mr duncan reminded the conference that he was a layman and of the society's wish to have an ordained man in his place and asked the conference whether it would not in view of these facts advise him to resign his connection with metlakatla he then left the room to allow the conference to fully discuss the matter without being hampered by his presence but was soon recalled when the following resolution which had been adopted by the unanimous vote of all members of the conference including the rev mr collison who at the time was stationed at metlakatla as a clergyman and who sustained very close relations to the bishop was read to him the conference having heard mr duncan's statement and knowing the value of his labors and experience not only in the work at metlakatla but also to the church missionary society's missions generally in the north pacific field unanimously decline to advise mr duncan to resign the question of his resignation having been disposed of in this manner another question naturally arose to wit how the difficulty involved in his remaining at metlakatla could be met when the society was demanding changes there which he could not conscientiously endorse he therefore asked the conference if it would not advise the society to allow metlakatla to become an independent mission work out its own destiny and defray its own expenses without in any sense changing its sympathy with the society's missions or missionaries in other places the conference after due deliberation again in his absence by majority vote 
passed a resolution advising the society to constitute metlakahtla into a lay mission and to leave the work in mr duncan's hands without clerical supervision the minority consisted of mr tomlinson mr duncan's special friend and ardent supporter so that the resolution as passed really was supported by the bishop's friends in the conference and opposed by mr duncan's real supporter nevertheless it was by bishop ridley afterwards characterized as absurd and cowardly the minutes of the resolutions adopted by the conference were soon afterwards forwarded by the secretary mr collison to the society in england mr duncan and mr tomlinson have always been of the opinion that in some way the wording of the last resolution at the instigation of or by bishop ridley himself was changed before the transmittal of the minutes to the society and unfortunately there seems to be no question about the correctness of this supposition it may be surmised that the report of the doings of the conference was followed almost immediately by letters from the bishop to the society poisoning its mind against mr duncan and his position at metlakahtla that and that alone can explain the subsequent action of the society towards mr duncan the latter thought it only fair to wait a decent time before writing to the society a long letter detailing his position both with reference to the question of closer church connection at the mission and the administration of the sacraments especially that of the lord's supper giving his reasons for such position before the receipt however of this letter the society after receiving the minutes of the conference and the bishop's epistles wrote mr duncan a letter inviting him to come to london to confer with them on the future status of the mission at metlakahtla this letter dated september twenty ninth eighteen eighty one he received while in victoria where he had gone to purchase machinery for a salmon cannery which he had made all arrangements for starting in metlakahtla to time for the coming season this was a project which he had a long time had in mind as the only practical way of giving the indians any proportionate benefit from the visits of the piscatorial host to their ancient salmon streams by it he saw an opportunity to further aid the natives to an independent living he immediately answered the letter of the committee stating that under the circumstances it was at that particular time impossible for him to go to england as to do so would postpone for a year the instalment of this important industry but that if the committee after receiving the letter in which he had fully covered all matters with reference to the mission and which had crossed on the way the letter just received by him still deemed it desirable for him to come home for a conference he would cheerfully comply with its request as soon as the present pressing preparations with reference to the new cannery had been got out of the way as he bid his friends in victoria an affectionate farewell and started for his little home among the indians he little suspected what surprises awaited him on his arrival at metlakahtla end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakahtla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf. the rupture it was on the twenty eighth day of november eighteen eighty one that he landed in metlakahtla the steamer on which he came brought with it a great many tons of freight for him and stayed several hours in the harbor discharging its cargo hardly had mr duncan turned the key in the door of his office before bishop ridley rushed in and in an excited tone asked him if he was going to england to meet the committee mr duncan calmly informed him that he was not just at present but that if the committee after receiving his communication sent them some time ago were of the opinion that his presence in england was desirable he would go as soon as it was possible for him to do so without interfering with his plans absolutely necessary for promoting the welfare of metlakahtla there said the bishop with a malicious gleam in his eyes as he thrust at mr duncan with as much self-satisfaction as if he had been dealing the last deadly blow to a mortal enemy a sealed envelope and then as mr duncan opened it and read it i guess i am master now well bishop have you not acted a little prematurely have i refused to go home but all the same i thank you for this it clarifies the situation considerably this was the letter handed to mr duncan by the bishop 
church missionary society salisbury square london e c september twenty ninth eighteen eighty one to mr w duncan dear brother duncan the envelope containing this letter is placed in the hands of the bishop of caledonia with a request that he will hand it to you only in the event of your refusing to come home to confer with the committee and continuing your opposition to the spiritual work of the mission being carried on in accord with the principles of the church of england as accepted by this society with the deepest pain and sorrow the committee has come to the conclusion that in such a contingency they have no course to pursue but to take the necessary steps for dissolving your connection with the society we feel that we need hardly assure you that the committee have followed with admiration and thankfulness the history of the development of metlakahtla under your hands the devotion resolution and energy with which you have stuck to the work and the wonderful influence you have been permitted to exercise over the indian mind are by no means forgotten and the memory of them must live so long as the history of the mission survives whatever be its future but the committee feels that they have paramount duties to fulfil both towards the native church built up through the agency of this society and also towards the members of the society at home we seek the extension of the kingdom of our dear lord and saviour and the principles that actuate the society are well known our allegiance to our lord forbids us to go from these principles it is now our painful duty to request you to arrange as soon as possible for the handing over to the bishop of caledonia the charge of our mission we have asked him and have no doubt that he will accede to our request to act for us temporarily and to assume the charge of the mission we cannot tell whether this decision of the committee will bring you home to england but whether by letter or by verbal communication we shall be thankful to enter into communication with you regarding a final grant footnote one cannot be surprised at the poor english of the committee at a moment when they dared to hold out to mr duncan the promise of a money bribe if he would only play the traitor to his indians and give them up End footnote we cannot but repeat the expression of the deepest sorrow with which we have to convey to you a decision which has cost the committee much pain god grant that all may be overruled for good and the advance of his kingdom and may his blessing and guidance ever rest on you we remain dear brother duncan yours very faithfully in the lord fred e wigram w gray secretaries in this cruel heartless unchristian way was then to be rung down the curtain over one of the most wonderful works accomplished by one man in the world's history of missions the church not christ was to rule metlakahtla when one remembers that this letter bore the same date as the letter received by mr duncan in victoria simply inviting not summoning him to london for conference and that in that letter no hint even was given of the intention of the committee to sever the relations if he did not come home one will readily admit that the course of double dealing and underhandedness of the bishop of caledonia had manifestly been adopted by the committee if not by the society as well it was perhaps only meet that the bishop should not even respect the conditions imposed by the committee before severing as far as in the power of the society lay mr duncan's connection with his life work at metlakahtla which well might have deserved a greater consideration and gratitude but should deliver the letter to mr duncan though he to the bishop's knowledge never had refused to go home to england the bishop undoubtedly fearful of the consequences of this overreaching unless he could be present in person and excuse it did not choose to comply with the committee's request to take charge of the mission but deputized mr collison to act as the agent of the society and precipitately fled to england on the same steamer on which mr duncan had arrived at metlakahtla one of the indians seeing him leave on the steamer the bishop had expected mr duncan to take out of metlakahtla cried after him as he left the beach haman was hanged on his own gallows was he not immediately upon receiving this inconsiderate dismissal from his life work in connection with the society mr duncan prepared to leave and vacate the mission house when what had transpired had spread like prairie fire in the village one of the indian houses was at once set aside for him and hundreds of loving hands were ready to carry his furniture and his books to the new quarters 
there was great excitement and the feeling at the outrageous conduct of the society and the bishop ran high but be it said to the credit of the indians there was no breach of the peace that same evening a meeting was held at which the indians unanimously passed a resolution requesting mr duncan to remain as their preacher and teacher but he refused to give them an answer then as they were excited and many of the people were away the same answer he gave to another resolution of similar import adopted at a second meeting held shortly afterwards before deciding he wanted to be sure that all the people were with him and that their action was not taken in haste and excitement which they might rue thereafter the church had not been opened from the time of his dismissal till about christmas time when everybody was back in the village the elders then called a meeting in the church for discussion on the action of the society all the natives came out sick and well young and old even the cripples humped along as fast as they could only mr duncan was absent he did not want to influence them by his presence the meeting did not last long these people intuitively felt what he had done for them and what he had been to them they knew that they owed him all that they now prized happy homes loving families peace order civilization and most of all a sure hope of heaven and they needed no long harangues in order to know what to do a few speeches were made short to the point and full of feeling every heart beat in unison and when one of the elders put the question to them will you have the bishop or shimalget for your leader footnote the chief the name which all of them had given to duncan for years every child in the village knew who shimalget was there was only one of that name in the village End footnote. even the holy place where they were and their great respect for it could not restrain a shout of shimalget which almost shook the solid walls and when a show of hands was called for every hand in the house was raised for mr duncan not one hand stirred for the bishop now mr duncan was sent for he came the elders met him at the door and conducted him to a seat prepared for him at the head of the central aisle one of the elders george usher then approached a bible in hand and turning to the congregation said you are now asked to confirm with your own voices your action at the different meetings and to say whether you wish mr duncan to continue as your teacher and minister all of you who so desire show it now to mr duncan by holding out your hand to him every hand in the audience went out to their beloved teacher the elder turned to mr duncan placed the bible in his hand and said in behalf of this christian congregation i say to you continue to be our minister and go on teaching the word of god as you have done for the last twenty years that is all the ordination as a minister of the gospel mr duncan ever had methinks that perhaps it may suffice even if it is not strictly according to ecclesiastical rules mr duncan at least considers it as sacred and holy as the laying on of hands would be by a bishop who to such an extent forgot all mandates not only of christian priesthood but of christian manhood that he did not hesitate to report to the society in face of the foregoing facts which constitute the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth the following misrepresentation at one of the public meetings mr duncan put the question will all on the lord's side hold up their hands all held up their hands then he artfully said all on the bishop's side hold up their hands imagine their surprise at being thus ensnared several afterwards told me that they did not know that mr duncan was the lord or they would not have raised their hands mr duncan briefly told them that he accepted their call and assured them that he would remain as their teacher the public services were now resumed as well as the educational work in the school public improvements were again started the work went on just as if there had been no rupture and all mr collison had to do in order to earn his salary as the society's agent was to hold on to the keys of the mission house which mr duncan had turned over to him End of chapter 31